Today, we're going to talk about how to save your pipelines and potentially your clusters uh, with Tecton results. Uh, my name is Adam Kaplan. I'm a software engineer at Red Hat, and I'm a contributor to the Shipwright and Tecton projects. Uh, I also represent Red Hat on the CDF uh, governing board. I've been with Red Hat now almost five, a little over five years, uh, helping uh, companies deliver uh, container images uh, on Kubernetes. Uh, and before that, I helped companies deliver actual physical containers at a logistics-focused consulting firm. Uh, I wish my colleague uh, Dibio uh, Mukherjee uh, would be here with me, um, but unfortunately he couldn't make it here to Vancouver, uh, but he had a huge part uh, in this uh, session and also with the results project itself, and he deserves a lot of credit for what you're about to see here today. Um, so there's a small group here, so uh, I just want to ask a quick show of hands. How many of you here are running Tecton for uh, either your teams or things that you are building within your companies? Got a few hands. <laughs> Got a few folks uh, up front who I definitely know they're using Tecton. <laughs> um, and so if you want to keep your hands up, uh, how long have you been running those clusters for? If you've been running them longer than three months? Got a few fewer hands, um, more than a year. Um, longer, more, OK, yep. <laughs> uh, so those of you who have had to operate Tecton in production, uh, you know that there are some real fundamental challenges to operating it. And for those who haven't, uh, I'd like to give a quick uh, explanation of why that is the case. Um, so when a lot of teams start building container images in particular with Tecton, uh, they'll create a pipeline that looks kind of like this, where you're going to clone your source code. You're going to probably spin off a set of tasks that will actually build a container image, most likely push it to container registry. Um, while at the same time, with that source code, you'll run some kind of static uh, SAS analysis, like a tool like SNCC, or maybe something that is specific to your programming language, like GoSec. Once the container image has been built, uh, you might have another step where you're going to then scan the container image uh, so that you can look for vulnerabilities with like the actual underlying base image, for example. And then at the end, you'll want to pull it all together, analyze what happened, make a determination whether or not the pipeline succeeded or failed. Um, so for folks who are maybe it's new for Tecton or uh, uh, they're experimenting with it for the first time, um, Tecton is a cloud-native effectively workflow engine uh, that you put on top of Kubernetes. Um, and so the question for the audience is, does anyone know where this data lives, this pipeline? Where, where does this actually go? Well, if you have operated, you will want, you may find out. Uh, it is actually there in Kubernetes itself. Um, and in the first versions of Tecton, uh, your tasks and your pipelines uh, had to be stored on the cluster as custom resources. Uh, with the new resolvers feature, um, that is no longer a requirement. Um, and if you saw Christy and Wendy's talk yesterday, there are really a lot of good reasons that you want to use resolvers that are beyond just the storage savings. Uh, but once you start running the pipeline, each task and step has to be stored in full uh, so that the system has a fixed definition of what to run. Um, your pipeline runs will then spawn task runs. Those task runs create pods. You might get a PVC or three in there. Um, you'll also need things like secrets and config maps, so you can do things like pull from a source from a private Git repository, push your container image to a container image, or container registry, I should say, uh, and so forth. Uh, but unfortunately, with each pipeline run and task run, you are adding fuel to a potentially explosive situation. Each object stored means that the pipeline controller needs to do more work when it is restarted or upgraded or even kind of reconciled. Uh, more data in Kube means that you're going to have potentially slower etcd queries, which is the database behind Kubernetes. Uh, and anything that is on top of that um, just gets slower and more sluggish. Um, so it's not just the Kubernetes API server. If you have like a web console, for example, that'll get slower. Um, 
Tekton has a CLI called TKN that makes it easier to run your pipelines. Uh, that too will start getting slower. Um, everything will start just getting bogged down. Uh, but really more importantly is that etcd has a hard storage limit of eight gigabytes, um, which for running workloads, uh, that's great. Um, but for a persistent store, that is really terrible. I think we're going back maybe 30, 40, 40 years in terms of what our capabilities are. Uh, that sample build pipeline that I showed you before, if you actually take the data out of Kubernetes and uh, ultimately it's just all JSON, there's really uh, not a ton of it, um, compaction or um, uh, compression that is going on with that data. Um, it can take up you know, about 30, 300 kilobytes, give or take. Um, and if you do a little bit of math um, on a real world cluster, you might be able to hold about 15,000 of these. This was just some quick back of the envelope math that I did there. Um, because in the real world, um, you might not just have a dedicated cluster for CICD. You might be running your own application workloads on there. Uh, you might have other things on your cluster that are running as operators, such as like Argo CD. Uh, anyone who is using OpenShift, OpenShift 4 has a lot of operators that get installed. Um, so by some of my math, hand wavy math, 15,000 is probably a good kind of like round number. So as your cluster scales, if you don't do anything else, um, the clock starts ticking on your cluster. And the more people that start uh, joining your CID CD cluster, start doing more work with it. As more projects get onboarded, that clock ticks faster and faster and faster. Um, uh, I use Kubernetes CI as like an example of uh, CI at scale. Um, the Kubernetes project uh, is one of the bigger open source projects in the world today. Um, uh, I want to thank the uh, SIG Infra folks and Ben Elder in particular particular for pointing me to the data that if you look at it today, they're doing about uh, over 20,000 um, jobs a day. And they're not using Tecton, they use a system called Prow. Um, but a job is, if you wanted to use it with Tecton, it would be effectively a pipeline run. Um, and so if you wanted to just take what Kubernetes CI was doing today and try to do it with Tecton, your cluster would not even last a full day. Um, quick show of hands, who, those who have either done use Tecton in prod or are just running Kubernetes in prod, how many of you have had a cluster die because there were too many objects in it and you ran out of storage? I got one hand in front. <laughs> uh, I can tell you right now, uh, at Red Hat, uh, we manage uh, OpenShift clusters for our customers. Um, and there were definitely some early days where uh, we were, had tech preview of our version of Tecton and we had clusters dying left, right, and center. So as a naive kind of solution to this, uh, you can try averting disaster by having a quota. So Kubernetes lets you define quotas on like how many objects you have. Um, you can have a quota here where you have like, okay, three because so many people are using my CI cluster. Uh, but once my pipelines are run and I try to run another pipeline run, I can't, I get this error from Kube saying that, oh, you've exceeded your quota. Um, so this is kind of useless to a developer. What good is your CI system if eventually you can't run anything on top of it? Um, so the next logical thing you could do is start deleting those old ones. Um, and you know, that helps. It certainly frees up the storage, um, but especially for CI CD, those pipelines contain a lot of really important information. Um, things like the logs. So when you try to debug a failed pipeline, um, if you delete your pipeline run and everything that's underneath it, you lose the logs. Um, if you want to do any kind of analysis, um, try to extract things like Dora metrics. Uh, you can't do it if you don't have the data. Um, so how can we save this data? Uh, that's where Tecton Results comes in. It is here uh, to help rescue you. So Tecton Results makes it easy to save your pipelines and logs off cluster and then provides a simple API that lets you access the data after the pipelines have been removed. So the results co project consists of two components. There is a watcher, which uh, for those who are familiar with Kubernetes tr terminology is a controller, uh, which monitors those pipeline runs and task runs as they execute on the cluster. And then there's an API server, which receives the data and provides an endpoint 
for users to access. The API server is backed by a Postgres compatible database, and uh, there's a new feature, logs feature, which I'll talk about in a bit, uh, that gives you optional storage for logs. Uh, so you can use like Postgres directly um, if you're using a cloud provider database service such as like Amazon RDS. Um, if you're using a Postgres compatible engine, uh, you can use that. So the way it works is that uh, the watcher will wait for your task run or pipeline run to complete, and then it'll send the data to the API server where it is stored in the database. If the logs feature is enabled, those two are streamed to the API server, which then stores it in the log storage backend that you configure, uh, which today we support uh, a persistent volume, block storage, or Amazon S3. So once the data is in the database, it can be retrieved over an HTTP API, uh, which can either be REST or gRPC. And so here's kind of an example, and I wanna kind of step back a little bit to kind of showcase it, um, where we are going to query the API um, to find a pipeline run and then find its subsequent task runs and other records. Uh, the way that you can do this with uh, results is a feature called CEL filtering. Uh, what CEL is, is it's a programmer-friendly syntax uh, that in our case with results uh, converts your programmer code language into effectively SQL queries. Not exactly. Um, so in this instance, uh, I have an example here. We are passing in a filter. We are filtering on data type. So each uh, thing in our results has a type. Uh, and if you notice here for pipeline runs, it looks very similar to the Kubernetes uh, typing of API groups, version, and kind. You can then also drill into the uh, data on the object itself. Um, and since uh, pipeline run is a Kubernetes object, it's a custom resource. Um, if you want to, we want to get it by its kube friendly name, we can use, uh, just look at metadata.name. Um, so I see if I can maybe fast forward a little bit. So once we have, uh, that information, we try and query it, and then we can actually see all the records that are related to this pipeline run. Uh, so you can see uh, we have the data for it here, um, and when you get it back from the API, it is uh, all JSON encoded, um, and it's all organized under the parent uh, for its namespace. Uh, we can then go a little bit further, and I'm just waiting to see where the demo goes. Yeah, so we can go further. And uh, for pipeline runs, by default, um, if it's just a pipeline run that was tr triggered by hand, um, we can use its unique ID to find the task runs and logs related to it. So once again here, there's a whole bunch of base64 encoded data uh, where you can see the task run. Um, and uh, we can go one step further further, once we have sort of know which records we want to search for. If we see we find a task run, we want to look more into what is in that task, task run and what was run. Let me just jump ahead. So what we can do then is uh, drill into t the task run itself. Um, and with a little bit of JQ, uh, Base64, and Base64 decoding, we can actually get the original task run uh, back out. So we'll go ahead and do that. Oh, there we go. Uh, so you can see uh, we have our, our task run back, uh, what was actually on the cluster. Um, as it's scrolling here, you can see uh, we have um, the specification. So this is a very simple example pipeline um, that's adding two numbers. There's a step here. Uh, you can see the container that was run, the commands, uh, everything that was run in this task, uh, as well as some other extra data. Um, so I wanna call this out here. So in the annotations, uh, one of the things that Tarkton Results does is it pulls out um, basically a locator where you can find this data once it's been removed from the cluster. And so you can see uh, it's got uh, a reference to the parent result that it's under, uh, the record that's related to, and also where you can find the log uh, for this task run. 
And speaking of logs, we can then go the next step further and uh, look at the logs themselves, uh, since I have the logs feature enabled in this demo. Um, and it's just uh, like before, we can use JQ and a little bit of base64 decoding. Uh, and with the special, the new logs endpoint uh, that was added, we can uh, actually get the logs data back. Um, and just one moment. Uh, there we go. This was a very simple one, but uh, we have our log back, and now we can safely uh, delete this task run and pipeline run from our cluster. Um, so how does this all work under the hood? Um, the foundation is a very generic data model uh, consisting of results and records. Um, the records are what you probably saw in um, the, the returns from the API server, um, where we just use types to define uh, the value, um, and the value is all encoded JSON. Um, Postgres, uh, what's neat about it is a very powerful JSON support, um, and we can, uh, if you are operating it, you can add indexes uh, that make it easier to do your own queries and analyze the underlying data. Um, the results are used to kind of group the records together, and out of the box, uh, results uses owner references uh, to organize things. Um, it also has support for triggers, so if you're using Tecton triggers uh, and you use a trigger to start one or more pipeline runs, your trigger ID can be used to group all of your pipeline runs and task runs together. All results also have a parent, which I may have alluded to earlier, uh, which defaults to the object's namespace on Kubernetes. Um, it doesn't have to be that, technically, uh, and the terminology is intentionally uh, a little abstracted. Um, at, towards the middle and end of last year, I was working on a team where we were actually uh, extending results so it worked with the KCP project, uh, so it technically went beyond just Kubernetes namespaces into the broader KCP workspace concepts. Um, as alluded to earlier, um, Results also has API support for gRPC in addition to REST. Um, the Watcher, in fact, uses gRPC to send the data to the API server, um, not just the JSON that we send over, but then with the logs feature, we're actually using it to stream the data in a way that not only has low latency, and, but it also uh, ensures that we don't overload the API server too much. Um, if you want to know what gRPC is, it's an implementation of protocol buffers. Um, I really should add links here to explain what that is. Um, it's a great project. Um, definitely go check it out. We also uh, have a feature that lets you use uh, Kubernetes RBAC to control who and what can access to the data in results, especially once that data is no longer on the cluster. Um, so one of the cool things about uh, results uh, is that uh, how you define RBAC does not have to be tied to an actual custom resource on the cluster. Uh, so we kind of have a effectively convention where we have virtual custom resources. They don't actually exist on the cl cluster. They exist in results, uh, but we have defined an API group for it. Um, we define resources for it, which we then use to control who has access to what. And we use similar conventions to Kubernetes when it comes to uh, create, read, update, delete, um, uh, permissions. So uh, this is an example here of a uh, read-only role uh, for the namespace where you have permission to get and list um, all of the, the results. And so uh, here's an example in action where um, we have uh, two namespaces where we've got two pipeline runs, and I'm going to speed things up a little bit. Uh, we've got a cluster role defined that is effectively read-only. Uh, and we have a service account uh, that is uh, binds to the role. Um, Tecton results also part of the install. Uh, we provide a cluster role that gives you read-only namespace. Um, so using a role binding, you uh, can have read-only uh, for the results objects uh, in your uh, in that in a single namespace. And so in this example, I have another um, namespace um, similar. Uh, it's a role binding. Um, uses that same uh, read-only cluster role. Um, and with the RBAC system, uh, we use uh, token uh, access reviews to figure out, auth do the auth authentication, uh, and then that does the, uh, we use subject access reviews for authorization. Uh, so 
to access the record, uh, we first need to get a token. Uh, it doesn't have to be a service account token. Uh, if your cluster is configured to use uh, OIDC providers, you can use an OIDC provider. Um, and so with that token, if that token corresponds to a user or service account with the right permissions, you can see the data. Uh, but then if I want to go and try and use the service account of a different namespace and access um, the parent in another that represent, corresponds to, um, say, that original one, and if you don't have permission, you will get a permission denied error. Um, so I hope I'm not too closer over time. Uh, I want to, uh, so what's next uh, for Tekton results? If you like what you see and you want to um, see where we are going with the project. Um, so many of the current contributors are trying to operate results at scale. So performance is definitely top of mind. Um, a lot of the community have lately uh, introduced uh, significant database performance improvements. Uh, and we know, we have learned through operating it um, that there are improvements we can make to uh, that RBAC authentication and authorization. Um, a feature like caching is something that we don't have right now, but would definitely not only improve performance, but also take load off of the Kubernetes API server. In terms of the uh, log storage feature, so the log storage feature started out as a TEP, and uh, one of the uh, Tekton maintainers, Christy, is here in the audience. Uh, we had a great talk about good KubeCon 2021, right, virtual, where we talked about TEPs and uh, enhancement proposal processes. Uh, so shameless plug, go ahead and check that out. It's on YouTube. Um, in that, we uh, discussed uh, initially rolling out the gate with um, persistent volumes, S3, but we definitely have visions of more object storage providers. Um, whether it is uh, like cloud provider storage for Google, Azure, um, any time, any other kind of like object storage um, is something that's certainly on the roadmap. Um, log forwarding service integrations is also another uh, thing that was uh, identified as a good thing to have. Um, many clusters in production, uh, they are installing a log forwarder and using a log aggregator whether that is something like Elastic, Loki, um, Stackdriver, CloudWatch, um, the list goes on. Um, there are lots of good tools that also are doing the job of uh, extracting your logs and forwarding them. So um, sometimes it's a matter of just let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's figure out a way where we can rely on those tools to extract the logs and then provide an interface around the destination. Um, Finally, uh, in terms of other things that uh, are sort of like we've explored as a part of uh, results as purview, um, there's a older tip out there about automatic resource cleanup. And so results actually has this feature enabled in the watcher where uh, if you configure it uh, with the right flag, um, it will delete your either task run or pipeline run for you um, once it knows that the data has been uh, stored in the database. Um, that is uh, something that right now is just like at the cluster level, but there is certainly um, a need to also define that uh, for individual namespaces, especially if you are operating Tekton in a multi-tenant environment. Uh, we have also been working with um, the Tekton Artifacts project. Um, this started as TEP86 and has now morphed into the Data Interfaces Working Group. Um, and so we've been uh, sort of starting the conversation about whether or not results should fit in here as like a sort of part of the solution. Um, this is still new exploring territory. We're still uh, trying to understand the problem spaces and whether or not uh, this is something where results can play a part. Uh, and finally, in terms of integrating with the rest of the Tekton ecosystem, so um, if you looked at the abstract, I did mention the TKN results plugin, and I did not demonstrate it here today. Uh, but yes, we do have a uh, plugin for uh, uh, the TKN command line. Uh, the TKN, TKN command line, which you probably saw in some of those commands, it makes it easy to uh, manage your Tekton pipelines. Um, it works like a kube cuddle uh, plugin 
where uh, you can, it lets you extend it um, and it has uh, support for accessing, at least right now, the results and records. Um, we need to upgrade that so it uh, can now result uh, it can support the logs feature. Um, we've also talked about uh, having integrations with the Tekton dashboard. And last but not least, uh, we can definitely use improvement with our docs. Um, uh, those who know me, uh, I am very much, uh, uh, docs is very close to my heart. Uh, I got my start uh, with the cloud native ecosystem by contributing to docs. Uh, and uh, it's something that is very hard to do. Um, so uh, we don't just need code contributors. Uh, if you are a technical writer or if you, your company is using Tekton results and you have technical writers on your staff, uh, we would love you to come to the community and contribute. And speaking of the community, um, if you want to get involved, uh, the code is on GitHub and that is primarily how we um, manage uh, the backlog uh, with GitHub issues. Uh, we also have a Slack channel on the Tekton Slack, uh, hashtag results. Uh, you can also join the Tekton mailing list. If you join Tekton Dev, uh, you not only get access uh, to the mailing list, you get access to the calendar and the docs. Uh, and we have a working group that meets every week via Zoom. Uh, we, uh, we have a pretty globally distributed team who is working on this. Uh, so we split between uh, time zones. We have uh, basically, East Hemisphere, West Hemisphere. East Hemisphere uh, meets at 8 a.m. Eastern, 1300 UTC every Thursday. And for the Americas, it's at 1230 p.m. Eastern, uh, 1730 UTC. Um, I do have a link to the working groups document, except I need to update it so that that information is all there. Um, so uh, without a further ado, I think we've got a few minutes left for questions. So um, anyone have questions about results? All right, um, one last thing. Oh, Andrea has a question over there. Okay, sorry, I was just thinking when you mentioned the dashboard integration, um, where it would, whether it would make sense or do you have any plan to start getting resources in results as they evolve as well? So before the, like, getting a task on your results before it's finished so you, you could point then the dashboard directly to it without having to switch between so the uh uh so we had i think the so the reconciler actually it does start updating the database as the task run is running that's actually kind of how we get those annotations okay. onto the task run in the first place um so in theory uh you could just start accessing the data on results once it's been uh, been put there. Cool, thanks. Um, but I guess to follow up on that, it might just be the matter of like, if you're looking at the data there, just like Kube and Tekton, it's a controller, so it's not gonna be real time, it's gonna be eventually consistent. <laughs> uh, any other questions? All right, I think we've got maybe one minute since we started a little late. Um, uh, one last thing is that we have a logo and actually five logos to be exact. Um, so the wonderful uh, and talented artists at the Linux Foundation have provided these five candidates uh, for the project uh, so that we can join our fellow friends uh, with a logo in the Tekton project. Uh, we have an active poll that's open on GitHub and discussion, so please um, take a look, vote on your favorite, and let us know what you think. Which one's your favorite? Uh, I do not want to bias <laughs> the, the poll. <laughs> so, uh, see me outside afterwards, maybe at the bar, and then we could chat. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for joining. I hope you all enjoyed uh, CDCon and GitOpsCon and uh, enjoy Vancouver and the rest of your week if you're staying for Open Source Summit. Thank you.